ESPN as we continue Jim Balvano's fight against cancer. The Duke Blue Devils are back home for the first time in a couple of weeks to take on South Dakota out of the Summit League and the Cameron Crazies are ready to go. You're watching the ACC on ESPN. And welcome everybody along with Corey Alexander. I'm Doug Sherman and we are in for a treat, an opportunity to see Marvin Bagley III, who Corey is on pace to shatter every freshman record in Duke program history. And not only the freshman record, he's also on pace to join elite company in Anthony Davis and Kevin Durant as the only freshman to win freshman of the year as well as the Wooden Award. And Marvin Bagley right now is the best player in college basketball, hands down. No question about it, the numbers just jump at you. And he is somebody who, in spite of his relative inexperience, plays with a calm and a presence that you just don't usually see out of kids his age. And it's not even just the calm and the presence, but more importantly, it's the motor. And that's what sets him apart from everyone else. So how will the Coyotes defend Marvin Bagley III? Well, keep your eye on number 13, Mooney. He is their top scorer at over 18 points per game. And Hagedorn inside is a legit 6'10", but he has never faced anything like he's about to face here this afternoon. One senior starter for Duke is always Grayson Allen, surrounded by four freshmen, and we are underway. Wendell Carter controls, and the Blue Devils have it first. And interesting to see, South Dakota is a man-to-man -man team, but Duke doesn't see a lot of man-to-man -man because of how good they are and their ability to get to the rim as we see Gary Trent Jr. get off to a fast start. This is Matt Mooney with a basketball, a six foot three inch junior transfer from the Air Force Academy, and he has had a tremendous start to his season. These are the South Dakota Coyotes, not Coyotes, the Coyotes out of the Summit League. And there is the classic stretch five, Tyler Hagedorn knocking down the three. And that's going to be the key, but you have to get back defensively against the Blue Devils. They push it as well as anyone in the country, and you cannot allow Grayson Allen to get easy looks to start off a game. And not surprisingly, it's Allen guarding Mooney to start the ball game. Hagedorn. Quickly inside to Carter. Killed his dribble, so he put it up. Long rebound off the hands of South Dakota's Trey Birch Manning. Duke will keep. And you see the other problem having to defend the Duke Blue Devils. They lead the nation in offensive rebounding. They're rebounding 43% of their misses, so not only do you have to stop them on their first attempt, but second and third often on many possessions. Yeah, the size inside for Duke and the athleticism is really impressive. Bagley is 6'11", 234. Wendell Carter, 6'10", 259. And again, they're both freshmen. And, and also, you're seeing a different style of play for the Blue Devils in the one-and-done era as we see Grayson Allen with a beautiful left hand. But when you talk about what has happened really since Duke won a national championship in 2010, they have had more one-and-dones, more so than anyone other than Kentucky, throughout the country. And they've had to play four out, one in. Now they're traditionally playing a three-out, two-in style, which clogs up the lane quite a bit with those two bigs in there. Allen shoots an air ball when Duke was playing five on four. Mooney had fallen into the front row of photographers and was late to get back. He's all right with the ball now. Poked out of bounds by Trayvon Duvall. And the Coyotes will keep. Duke is 9-0. They've played nine games in 20 days. This is their 10th game in 22 days, and it really is an NBA schedule in terms of volume for Coach Krzyzewski's team. Well, that's fair enough because pretty much everyone on the court right now for Duke will be in the NBA next year, so <laughs> Coach Cage is giving his guys a little bit of early exposure. And they have traveled the country time and again already less than a month into the season. Bagley has it knocked away, and the foul is called. And one of the things you're going to see from South Dakota throughout this game is where they double team Marvin Bagley Jr. and Wendell Carter when they get the ball. I'm sorry, Marvin Bagley the third, Wendell Carter Jr. when they get the ball on the block. And 
Coach Craig Smith told us that they will double team in something that they're used to doing, but I'm not sure if they've ever had to double team a combination such as this. Trent, a couple of close looks, able to get it back, and there's that offensive rebounding you were talking about, Corey. They get multiple opportunities, and Grayson Allen has seven points right off the bat. And Grayson Allen getting seeing a open lane. He talked about the fact that with the two bigs being in there, he doesn't see as many open lanes as he has throughout his career at Duke. But a young man that I used to call Crash because of the way he landed on the floor so many times going to the rim. When he sees the opening, he's always going to attack it. Hagedorn now with a pair of three-pointers to keep the Coyotes close. 9-6 Duke. Duvall, who we last night saw on the Cameron floor getting up shot after shot, is working on that shot. He looked good on his first attempt. And Trayvon Duvall only shooting 15% from three-point range early in the season. But as you mentioned, probably got in a good hour's worth of work last night after South Dakota's practice working on his shot. And form coming true for him early in this game. They wave off the bucket. The call is going to be changed. It was initially called against South Dakota, but the foul actually will go on Bagley, I believe, picking that one up. Yeah, they said 34 in red, but Nick Fuller has yet to check into the game, so it has to be against Wendell that, Carter, Jr. Wendell for Carter Duke. Jr. But they still say no basket. And if I'm South Dakota, I'd be a little concerned about why there was no basket because it was a tip in. No question. And Moody gives it back. Yeah, the Coyotes head coach is a gentleman by the name of Craig Smith. And this is a huge deal for him and his program to be here in Durham. Absolutely. And Craig Smith talked about the due diligence that he really did. Been trying to schedule this game at Duke since he actually got the head coaching job at South Dakota. And feels as though they were very fortunate to be able to make it happen. But also, they want to come in here and be able to compete and get a win. They're not just coming in happy to be playing at Duke. They want to be impressive while they're here. Look at the Blue Devils attack the rim. And they're the first two points for Marvin Bagley. And one of the reasons why I wanted to make sure that we talked about the offensive rebounding of Duke early in this game, they already have four, but more importantly, is such a staple of what they do offensively. When the ball goes up, they feel as though it should be theirs, not as though they're doing something beneficial. It should be theirs. Well, they're going to have to start chasing people off the three-point line. There's another triple. First three points of the afternoon for Matt Mooney. And when you are South Dakota and you come in and play an environment such as this, the one thing that can always be equalizer for you is the three ball. And right now, South Dakota getting started off shooting extremely well in what is a great shooter's gym. That was a pass that could have been stolen. Instead, it's another layup but missed by Duvall. Along the baseline, Carlton Hurst kicks to Mooney. And that's going to be a traveling violation. Our first media timeout sees Duke up five over South Dakota. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by the DQ Chicken Strip Basket with 100% all-white meat chicken, only at your DQ. About trusting each other, playing with each other, and it doesn't matter who gets the credit. So let's go make this happen. Let's go! The University of South Dakota is located in tiny Vermilion, South Dakota, along the Missouri River. It's on the Nebraska state line, and these folks, more than 100, have made the trip. Yeah, sure you want to, but they are thrilled to be here in Durham. And, and for a program, Corey, that's only been Division I for a decade, it's a really, really big deal to be here at Cameron. And the first time that they've actually started out 7-2 in their Division I era, so Coach Smith feels as though this is the right team to be here at this time. And right now, 14-9, you have to say they've done pretty good holding their own. They're going to have to continue to keep Duke off of the offensive boards, but making three-pointers is going to be huge, especially for Matt Mooney, who already has two 30-point games on the road thus far this season. And among the seven wins early in the season for South Dakota was a blowout of the same Grambling team that went to Atlanta and beat Georgia Tech yesterday. And I'm not saying it's going to happen here today, but this South Dakota team picked second in the preseason in the Summit League behind South Dakota State is a worthy opponent. Grayson Allen with nine to lead all scores. And the 
Coyotes are coming off the win two nights ago at UM Keat KC, the uh, Missouri Kansas City Kangaroos. And beat them pretty good, 82 63. Wait a minute, you got coyotes and kangaroos on the same court? We did, it was a veritable zoo. Off the steal, here comes Bagler. And what often gets lost with this Duke lineup. When we talk so much about Bagley, and he's worthy of all the conversation that's had about him, but you think about the fact that you have the number one point guard in the 2017 recruiting class, the number one shooting guard in the 2017 recruiting class, a former All-American shooting guard in Grayson Allen, who two years ago averaged over 21 points per game, and by the way, another of the top bigs, when you think about Wendell Carter Jr. in the 2017 class, this is a talented lineup. And what becomes so important with talent is when that talent actually plays hard. The great hands by Trayvon Duvall diving on the floor and the wherewithal to find Marvin Bagley, who once he gets out in the open court, no other players want to be in the picture, especially if you're South Dakota. Stay out of the way. Just allow them to have the highlight on your own. You don't want to add the insult to the injury. Yeah, this Duke class led by that man who reclassified over the summer as the number one overall recruit in the class of 2017, Duvall gets the role. He was number six on that list, and you mentioned Wendell Carter, oh, by the way, at number five. I well, mean, it, it really is remarkable. And you think about all those guys were higher up until Marvin Bagley decides he wants to be in that class in August, so they all drop down a bit. Gary Trent Jr., I believe, ended up falling to number eight. And we, so when you look at it, there's so much talent, but when you talk about having that point guard, having Grayson Allen and Gary Trent Jr. in the perimeter, by the way, this is an interior team. With the shot clock at two, Carlton Hurst misfires from the corner. Here comes Grayson Allen. The Coyotes get back nicely. Tyler Peterson is coming to the game. He's trying to stay with Allen and is called for the foul. Well, coming up on ESPN, it's number two Kansas and Syracuse in the third annual Hoopal Miami Invitational at American Airlines Arena. You can see this one streaming live on the app as well. Jayhawks, a double digit favorite coming in, but the Orange is still yet to lose. And we talked about offensive rebounding, and Duke actually is the number one country as far as total overall offensive rebounds. But Syracuse actually averaging 16 and a half offensive rebounds, so they're ahead of Duke per game so going to be interesting to see how this one goes today but you look at that Kansas lineup five guys averaging in double figures a very balanced Kansas scoring attack largest lead of the afternoon is Grayson Allen has 12 quick points well perimeter shooting has not necessarily been the strength of this Blue Devils unit outside of Grayson Allen and freshman reserve Alex O'Connell Bucket by Nick Fuller, the Nebraska transfer. But in talking to Coach K before the ball game this afternoon, it's among the things that they work so hard on. You know Grayson Allen's going to be able to make shots. Coach K tells you he's not a good shooter. He's a great shooter. And, and Gary Trent Jr. is a good shooter. And when you look at the numbers that Coach K told us, he's not worried about Gary Trent. He knows he's going to make shots. But when you look at this Duke team, they have played five of their nine previous games away from Cameron Indoor. So when you've got a guy like this who can knock down shots on the road, best believe he's getting it done at home. Two years ago, Grayson Allen was a third-team All-American, and now he's playing a completely different style than he did then. But one thing that is familiar, he attacks the baskets with a reckless abandon. His ability to shoot the pull-up, and more importantly, the three ball, which he has done so well for Duke this year, has made him an elite-level scorer. But most importantly, Grayson Allen has become the unquestioned leader of this team, the only senior starting along with four freshmen in the Duke starting lineup. And what a coming out party Grayson Allen had helping the Blue Devils win the national championship his freshman year. And then he built on it with a huge sophomore season. Off the skip pass, Hurst misfires, fight for the basketball. And it's Marquise Bolden who pulled in the rebound. And one of the things I believe we'll see from Duke with the opportunity to see Jordan Goldwire in the game, Alex O'Connell as well, who gets an easy one at the bucket. 
You're going to see Duke play a deeper rotation here this afternoon than we've seen from them in their past few days. Coach K giving some guys that haven't had much opportunity to play many minutes and more of an opportunity today because he's talked about his guys are exhausted. When you look at the travel that they've had, the schedule that they've had to this point, they get an opportunity today to get some other guys with fresher legs some minutes. This Coach K in his 38th year here at Duke. 1969 graduate of West Point he served in the military for a number of years and uh, made quite a jump where he was head coach at Army with a losing record to get the job back in 1980 here at Duke and then he was allowed to have three losing seasons basically off the top before boom this thing exploded and he's talked a number of times about had that been in today's Society, he probably would have been fired here at Duke, but a great recruiting class that included Johnny Dawkins, one of my favorite Dukies of all time, and I guess I should say Jay Billis, he was in that class. <laughs> but no, Jay Billis, that class ended up playing in the Final Four 1986, and that really the story goes on from there, the legend that is Mike Krzyzewski. Alex O'Connell has it rattled out. The Coyotes with the basketball, down 15. Tyler Peterson. Jordan Goldwires into the ball game. The uh, freshman from Norcross, Georgia, hadn't played the last two games for Duke. Level of competition, though, for the Blue Devils throughout their first nine games of the season. For the most part, high level. I mean, we talk about the fact that they have traveled already 8,600 miles to play nine games. It wasn't like they were just playing Cupcake City. The schedule they faced the 12th toughest schedule so far this year in the country. And when I saw that it was the 12th toughest, that was surprising to me because I can't imagine, I know Wisconsin has played a very tough schedule, but it's hard to imagine that anyone in the country has played a better schedule than this, especially when you think about the games away from home. You know, this this is very a very tough schedule, especially when you're doing it with freshmen, regardless of the talent level of the freshmen. They're still in their first time doing this, but they have passed the test with flying colors. Well, Corey, that's what you're talking about with this guy, Marvin Bagley III, the way he runs the floor end-to-end, -end, the energy and ability to catch and finish. And the best thing about him, he does not take plays off. This is a young man, he runs the floor defensively, he runs the floor offensively, he goes after and attacks every rebound. And that's one thing I love about the, the combination of he and Wendell Carter Jr., they're selfish about their rebounds. These guys don't allow the ball to come underneath the rim. They go get it at its highest point because they don't want anyone else to get that basketball. Now Duke has all freshmen on the floor at the moment. We will see that throughout the game. And it was all five freshmen on the floor in the PK-80 semifinal after Grayson Allen fouled out. So the youngsters took them home against a very good Longhorns team through the end of regulation and then through overtime. And it was Marvin Bagley, the third, leading the way. Second personal foul on Wendell Carter Jr. And that'll get Javin Delorier back into the ball game. And Matt Mooney going to take his seat for South Dakota. And he's the young man that the Coyotes need to get going and get him an opportunity to get some put some points on the board. The Coyotes got off started pretty well shooting the ball from three, but since then, Duke's defense has picked up and made everything very difficult for South Dakota. Adorn working on Delorier who picks up the personal foul. A moment ago we saw the Cameron Crazies, the student section doing their thing, trying to give the whammy on the inbounder for the opponent. Not something this South Dakota bunch usually gets to see. Well, when you don't play in the ACC and you don't get to come here on a regular basis, this is an this is not just an environment that is easy to get used to. This is difficult to play in, and not because the Duke fans are mean. These are great fans. They, they're, but they're not me. It's fun playing in this environment, but you often walk into the arena and you and you think about the, the mystique and the history and everything that's happened here, and normally teams don't come in and have an opportunity to play well early because they're thinking too much about that. And when you look at it, <laughs> Duke's up 15 before you really start to play. Delorier picked up his second foul, an offensive rebound pulled in by Hagedorn. Sets up a wide open look, but it's missed by Brandon Armstrong. And Brandon Armstrong, who had a career high 16 point game earlier this year, got a good look at the three, and that's one where you have to take advantage of. 
Marvin Bagley gets an offensive rebound and the putback. He cost his teammate Delorier an assist. I was about to say, if I'm jabbing, I'm upset. Like, wait a minute. <laughs> Give me my assist on that play. But that's just hollow basketball. One of the things that Duke works on a lot, especially when they're playing with the two bigs, they've got to be able to pass the ball to each other. Four on three for the Blue Devils. Trent was open, gives it up, and now attacking from the wing is O'Connell. Chance for a three-point play for DeLaurier. Tomorrow at 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific on ESPN, it's the 16th annual Jimmy V Women's Classic presented by Corona. Number one, UConn takes on number three, Notre Dame at the XL Center in Hartford, Connecticut. It's also streaming live on the ESPN app. Anytime you think Connecticut women's basketball, you have to think about the fact that that's the only person I, you can honestly say that can rival Coach K right now as far as when you think, think about the best coaches. And not just in college basketball now, but the history of college basketball. Of course, John Wooden, who Coach K himself told me, is the guy. No question about that. But when you think Gino R. Emma and then Coach K, those two together, I believe they are the next tier of college basketball coaches that would be on that Mount Rushmore, if you had to say, of college basketball coach. Which you've been to Mount Rushmore. I'm a little jealous I've never had the opportunity to get there. And you schooled me on something yesterday. Had no idea that it was in South Dakota. Six hours away from Vermilion, where the University of South Dakota is. So I had never been to Vermilion, but I have been, yes, like you say, to see Mount Rushmore. And uh, you've got to get there. It's, you've been to 45 of the 50 states in the country, right? Yes. So you're lacking North and South Dakota. Mm -hmm. Idaho, Vermont, and Maine. Gotcha. Got, got to make it happen. But South Dakota is one. Mount Rushmore is something that I would definitely be interested to see. And Craig Smith is not interested in seeing Gary Trent Jr. knock down wide open three pointers anymore. As many more as the Cameron Crazies taking selfies, enjoying themselves at the expense of the Coyotes. ESPN's exclusive presentation of college basketball is brought to you by K Jewelers. Every kiss begins with K. Not far from Duke Chapel, Grayson Allen and the uh, Blue Devils are off to a flying start shooting the basketball today. And when you look at the numbers, only 6.7 three-pointers made per game, 252nd in the NCAA. And this Duke team averages over 47 points per game in the paint. But right here on their home court already, 5 for 9, getting started shooting the three. And if this Duke team is able to add that element to their attack, I don't think there's anyone in college basketball that will have a chance of beating them. And as we talked about earlier, Corey, they have spread it around a little bit. Allen's made three of those five. Duval and Trent have also hit three-pointers. Nick Fuller misses from the corner for the Coyotes. You know, it, and we talk about this Duke offensive attack. You have to take into account of what Michigan State was able to do against North Carolina, who's a very good team. Duke handled Michigan State without Marvin Bagley. Marvin Bagley only played 10 minutes in that game and got off to a great start, four points and six rebounds. And then got poked in the eye, missed the remainder of the game. Duke was still able to handle Michigan State, who you have to consider as one of the elite teams in college basketball right now. And doing that with freshmen that early in the season shows you how scary good this team can be. Bagley continuing to do work on the offensive glass. Well, the Blue Devils seize control with a run midway through this first half. Up big now. They have eight assists, zero turnovers so far. Very efficient on both ends. And this is for a tired team, according to Coach K, a team that was exhausted Wednesday night after their win at Indiana. And to come out and have this type of performance is really what he talked to us about earlier today, where he said, you know, how do we handle that type of prosperity? Because we probably feel as though we've accomplished something, yet we haven't really done anything yet. He's proud of what they were able to do in that stretch, but they haven't really won anything yet. This, this is a, you know, a marathon, not a sprint. Although uh, they have won a lot in terms of <laughs> really nice wins. I mean, it was just last Sunday, late, late night, East Coast time out in Portland, Oregon, where they won the PK-80, their bracket of it, then flew back here to Durham, spent a day, day and a half, then flew 
to Indiana, took on the Hoosiers, flew back, and then got Thursday off to rest. Had a practice yesterday, and here they are Saturday afternoon right back at it. And, and the most impressive thing about yesterday for me, and we talked about it earlier, Trey Duvall getting in the gym. And he wasn't just shooting around. He worked up a yeah, good sweat. He got, he got a good lather going, got a good workout in, preparing himself not just for today, but preparing himself for this season. This young man, as a point guard of the Duke Blue Devils, with all the weapons that he has around them, there's a tremendous amount of responsibility, but I've been around Trey Duvall for a very long time. He's up to the task, no question about it. Coach K said he would like for him to be a little more vocal, but this young man has been terrific thus far. 30 assists in his first three games, the most by any Duke player of all time. And when you think about that, there's some pretty heavy names on that list. That's pretty good. Yeah. Although I must say, you know, uh, like you say, you've known Trey Duvall for a number of years. I'm not so sure he was thrilled for you to interrupt his rhythm yesterday. We went over and, and wanted to say hello. He wanted to keep going. He was focused. I don't care. He stopped and said, hey. <laughs> <laughs> he stopped to talk to me. So if he didn't want me out there, he wouldn't have, he wouldn't have stopped his workout. No, but as soon as the Coyotes got off the floor here at Cameron with their two-hour practice, we stayed and chatted with Coyotes head coach Craig Smith for an hour. Almost immediately, Duvall was out there working, and like you said, we said hello, left, and that was an hour into his workout. Who knows how long he stayed here last night. Trent leans into the lane, count the basket, and a chance for three. And Duke has done a tremendous job of attacking the paint. Gary Trent Jr., who the best part of his game is what he's able to do in the mid-range, but you see the upper body strength capable of finishing that shot through the contact of Matt Mooney. And more importantly, you know, you give them credit for what they've done. People talk about that this is not a great defensive team, but they've done a very good job here thus far in keeping Mooney in track. He got off early, he had a couple of threes, but hasn't been able to do much since then. Well, you know, Duke won the PK-80 final against Virginia with its defense. Last two possessions for the Gators, who had been flying and taking a 17-point lead. It was consecutive turnovers, one steal by Duvall, that really ultimately won them that game. And when you, when you think about that game, and I can remember watching that on TV, I wasn't as fortunate as you were, as you say, I say that with anger in my voice, <laughs> to be able to be in Portland to watch that. But when you saw Duke get down that big, I mean, Florida came out, mm on fire mm. but no one panicked no one folded and it was just like that and three big three pointers in the first half by Gary Trent Jr. to get Duke back into that game really I think gave them a lot of confidence going into halftime and from there and again Florida came out in the second half still playing well but you know this Duke team is special they, they've got a chance to really be able to do something special this year very similar in my opinion to the and you know People may have a problem with me saying this, but the 2012 Kentucky team more so than the Duke 2015 team, which were only two teams in the one-and-done era to win national championships with a bunch of freshmen. Bolden turns it over. First turnover committed by the Blue Devils. Well, I ask you, I know each of the three games at PK-80, Portland State, uh, Texas, and Virginia, the Blue Devils were down at halftime. They were down double digits in both the semi and the final. How does this young collection stay together and win each of those games? Now you've said it twice. I was going to let the first one go. You keep saying Virginia, but it's Florida. I know you're thinking. I'm thinking Orange. You're right. I'm thinking about you and your alma mater. Thank you. No, Florida. But no, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And when you get an opportunity to look at it, you know, and, I, and Florida may be outside the Blue Devils, the most impressive team that I've seen mm -hmm. all year long. And to see the way that Chris Yoza is running that team, Jalen Hudson, Kayvon Allen, and their ability to score, and just more importantly, get up and down the court and share the basketball. For Duke to come back and win that game showed me a lot. And I'm sure Coach K learned a lot about his team in that game because I didn't think they would be able to make it back from that big punch they took early. And you know what? There's another turnover, another travel on Bolden. They still don't have Johnny Gunu. So, I mean, when the Gators get him back, think about him in the middle in that game and how that might have tipped the scales as well. Uh, well, it would have made a huge difference because when you think about Bagley going for his second consecutive 30 and 15 game, <laughs> I think Egbunu would have had something to do to that. So it might have been 25 and 12, <laughs> not quite 34 and 15. But, you know, 
This Duke team is special, no question about it. But I do like Florida, especially when you think about what you see from them most likely in March. I mean, a and real good in that league, and obviously Kentucky is talented, but you've got to think Florida is the team to beat at this point, right? I, I, I would think so, and you hear a lot of the experts talking about A&M, but I, I need to see them go out on, not on paper, but to go out and actually beat Florida on the court to say that A&M is the best team in the SEC. Here's Grayson Allen, 15 points to lead all scorers. A triple team on Bagley, which leaves a wide open three from the corner. Misfired by Goldwire. But you see the amount of energy and the effort that it takes from South Dakota just to keep Duke off of the glass. I mean, that's the thing is when a shot goes up, normally when you play against teams, you're basically, you find your man, you box out, and you keep them off the glass. Even if you box out the bigs for Duke, if the ball goes high enough, they just jump over top of you and go get it. And more importantly, once they get their hands on it, it's not as though they're looking to kick it out because they're so skilled when you think about Bagley and Wendell Carter and even Marquise Bolden and Javon Delarier, they're going to turn that into two points. And if not, you're going to be forced to foul. Them. Another offensive rebound off the missed front end. It's an easy two for Delorier. By the way, that was the second foul on Tyler Hagedorn, who was told by his coach Craig Smith before this game, you've got to take the fight to Duke's giant front line, but that's easier said than done. It's much easier said than done, especially the 44-year-old coach sitting on the sideline that doesn't have to go out and do it. <laughs> yeah, Craig Smith, 44-year-old, as you mentioned, from tiny Stephen, Minnesota. His mom and dad have made the trip here to Durham from Stephen. And uh, he is quite the storyteller. We really enjoyed our time with him yesterday. Boy, Grayson Allen is feeling it. Has but, he scored in every manner you can score already? But more importantly, do you see him on the floor after the shot? That's Grayson Allen at his best, attacking the rim, and more importantly, landing on the floor after the shot. It's not really his style. Of course, he'll take the points any way he can. But it, when it comes to talking about crash, if he's not hitting the floor after the bucket, he doesn't want it. You see Grace Dow, a beautiful left hand, and Duke is rolling. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, so the the Crosstown rivalry, which had to be suspended a few years ago because of trouble, more trouble today. I was about to say, this, this is not the first time that we've had that in that rivalry. Of course, you're talking about being in Cincinnati, a lot of bragging rights in that game, and those guys go out there and play hard. Sometimes it spills off the court. Foul before the shot will send Grayson Allen to the free throw line to shoot. He's got a one and one upcoming. And personal on the point guard, sophomore from Lincoln, Nebraska, Tristan Simpson, his first. The South Dakota roster is interesting. You know, there's not a huge recruiting base in the Dakotas for Division I basketball players. So if you're Craig Smith, who is from that part of the world, but has worked as an assistant at Colorado State and also in Nebraska under Tim Miles, he has to recruit from other parts of the country. So you find four Texans on this roster because of his years as an assistant for the high major program for recruiting in that state. And one of the things that he talked to us about yesterday, and more, more so than anything, was these guys from Texas coming in and trying to get acclimated to the weather in South Dakota, which, from my understanding, is the nicer of the Dakotas. <laughs> they say yes. it's got. They say this is the tropical Dakotas, <laughs> I, I believe, if they said it, compared to North Dakota where he went to school. So when you think about that, getting acclimated to the weather for these guys from Texas has been a little bit different for the Coyotes. Yeah, Vermillion, South Dakota is right on the Nebraska state line. They're about an hour south of Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and two hours north of Omaha. And those are the two nearest airports. So for this team to fly out, at minimum, they have to drive an hour to get there. Under three minutes to go in the half, and with the shot clock down, Paul Cool is Simpson. 
with the pull-up jumper, his first two. And Simpson now with this opportunity to be the starting point guard for the Coyotes, really picking up his scoring this year, still continuing to do a very good job. Passing the basketball, averaging 4.2 assists per game, but picking up his scoring average of over eight points a game now, and something that he didn't do much last year as a freshman. But you see his ability to be able to, more importantly, shoot the ball over a big. You're not going to have to shoot over many bigger guys than that as they play in the Summit League, so he's showing off a little bit of his scoring ability here at Cameron Indoor. Yeah, Simpson's from Lincoln, Nebraska, out of North Star High School. And he's having to replace pretty good point guard Trey Dickerson who led South Dakota to a regular season title last year. Layup in transition for Tyler Peterson. But uh, Trey Dickerson decided to go as a grad transfer to Georgetown. So he's playing his final season of college under Patrick Ewing in the Hoyas. Gary Trent Jr. Strong rebound by Hagedorn. They give South Dakota credit. They've settled in here over the past few possessions. Got a couple turnovers, turned them into scores. And just like that, now it's a 22-point game, but Mike Krzyzewski does not like the way that his team has operated over the past few minutes. And just like that, the timeout, Coach K wants to talk to his group. Join ESPN and the V Foundation in the fight against cancer. Visit v.org slash donate. All donations benefit the V Foundation for cancer research. With Corey Alexander, I'm Doug Sherman back in Durham, North Carolina. Sold out Cameron Indoor Stadium yet again. This is the 426th straight sellout. Last time they had an open seat in this building. You were a young man. It was 1990 with Boston College in town. I was young, not that young. I mean, I was a, I believe I was a junior in high school at that time. So in, in thinking about places to go to school and this is a place I always liked. And one of my first recruiting letters actually was from Duke. Tommy Amaker was the assistant coach here. Got a letter from Tommy Amaker. But once they took Bobby Hurley, and I knew I wasn't going to have an opportunity to come in and start right away. Smart man. <laughs> no longer on my list. And the folks in Charlottesville were very glad to have you. Kristen Simpson, tough shot. He missed that because he was thinking about who might block it. Well, right? and that's another area of concern. You know, when you think about Wendell Carter Jr. already with 21 blocks on the season coming in this game, Marvin Bagley had 20. You know, these guys aren't just getting it done on the offensive end. They make you think about where they are defensively as well. Coach K and his staff, you get a shot of Jeff Cape or John Shire's guy sitting there, not happy about the fact that you see the turnovers that we talked about how well Duke started the game, not turning it over. Mm -hmm. And now five turnovers since as the game has gotten up and down a little bit, continuing to give the Coyotes opportunities on the offensive end. Here goes Hagedorn again. Looked like Bagley may have gotten a piece. And Bagley dribbling it up. So skilled. Out of Phoenix, Arizona. Shooting 60% from the floor. Nice job by Mooney to po poke the ball away from Duval. And Duke will keep. Here's Trayvon Duval, freshman from Newcastle, Delaware. Played high school basketball at St. Benedict's in New Jersey before finishing up at IMG Academy where he was last year down in Bradenton, Florida. Five on the shot clock. Duval going to have to make it go, and his pass is deflected out of bounds. Duke has four seconds on the clock. And it'll be Duval to inbound. Well, and the benefit of being the Blue Devils at this point, when you have four seconds, you have the opportunity to throw it right over the top to one of those big guys. You don't really have to know a lot of basketball to know with that short of time on the shot clock where they're going. And, of course, against the Coyotes, they just don't have the size to match up with a guy like Wendell Carter Jr. right up over top of the rim. First couple of points. He's been saddled with a little bit of foul trouble here this afternoon. You kind of forget about Wendell Carter, relatively speaking, but he has five double-doubles already this year, tied for fifth in the country. And he's the only other freshman in the ACC that has been named the ACC Rookie of the Week outside of Marvin Bagley Jr. So, you know, when, when Wendell Carter has his opportunities, he's taken advantage of them, and he has gotten in foul trouble over their past three games and really had to miss time because of that. But he's a young man that is as skilled as any and has the ability to shoot the ball from beyond three-point range. 
believe me, the NBA lottery won't pass without his name being called in that this spring. Mm -hmm. Listed at 6'10", 259 out of Pace Academy. An Atlanta native. Four seconds to go in the half. They lob it up. Bagley comes down and puts it in. 14 points for Bagley, 19 for Grayson Allen leading the way. And the Duke attack has been very consistent with their top two guys coming out and having strong first half on the tune to 56 points. It's halftime. We'll be back with our Land Rover halftime report right after these messages with Chris Cotter, Alan Cuff, and Tom Green. It's V Week on ESPN as we continue Jim Balvano's fight against cancer. Back at a Cathedral of College Basketball, Cameron Indoor Stadium, the home of the Duke Blue Devils, the number one team in the country, up big as we get ready for the start of the second half. With Corey Alexander, I'm Doug Sherman, and the Blue Devils, well, they certainly played like the number one team in the country. They did, off to a season high, 56 points in the first half, and their best shooting half that they've had all season long. And they did it in so many different directions, so many different ways. Grayson Allen got started with beyond the three-point arc, knocking down three three-pointers in the first half. And Gary Trent, of course, had a good half, but all you have to do against when you're playing with Duke is get it up on the glass. Offensive rebound is part of the offense. Gary Trent getting into the lane and scoring as well as Trayvon Duvall. And pretty much all the usual suspects outside of Wendell Carter Jr. have gotten involved in the offensive effort for the Duke Blue Devils. 62% from the floor, as Corey mentioned, the best this season so far for the Blue Devils before the break. They've dominated the glass, as you'd expect. 14 second chance points to none for the Coyotes. Do the Coyotes have a run in them against this type of team in this environment? I believe they can make a run, but this is the dangerous time when you play against the Blue Devils. They're normally better to start the second half than they are the first half, but the, the Coyotes have to be able to take advantage of opportunities like this where Duke does not get a shot, turns the basketball over, and more importantly, they're gonna need Matt Mooney to start knocking down some three-pointers to give his team some confidence. Now, Duke played a clean first 12 or 13 minutes of this game with zero turnovers. Now they've got six, including one of their first possession, to start the second half. Tyler Hagedorn leads the Coyotes with eight points. And that rebound goes the other way. They say it was off the hands of Trey Birch Manning, a junior from Federal Way, Washington. And it goes Craig Smith's team. Once again, to start the second half, Duke has four freshmen starting around Grayson Allen, the lone senior. There's the distance on the jump shot for Bagley. He is up to 17 points. And for those who did not know, oh yeah, he can do that too. <laughs> when you think about Marvin Bagley, for everything that he does around the basket, a more than capable three-point shooter and great touch on the perimeter as well. He is now five of 16 on three-point shots this season. Matt Mooney was held in check by this Duke defense in the first half. He sets up his teammate. Hagedorn with the layup. He's got 10. Beat the post Carter. Over the corner. Wide open look. And Gary Trent Jr. left it short. A beautiful pass by Wendell Carter. Hurst, the senior from Denver, has five points. And this is the time where, you know, South Dakota has to settle in and realize it doesn't matter where you're playing, who you're playing against. You have to operate the way that you need to play basketball. With a huge lead in the first half, Duke definitely took over, took advantage of the game. But now if you're South Dakota, you just want to win the second half. It's not as necessarily as much as if you can get back into the game, but you can just win the second half. Well, Carlton Hurst is a physical specimen. Opponents will bounce off of him. And he is somebody who at least pound for pound can match up with the big boys in college hoops. Well, when you can squat 500 pounds or more, people should bounce off of you. And you <laughs> see everyone else is hyped about it. Carlton Hurst looks at it as this is nothing. I do this all the time. Just put 500 on my back. You can do that, can't you? I, I can do it. I can put 500 on my back. I would not get up. I, and the thing is, I'm just hoping that there would be something to break the 500 from crushing me underneath it. At my best... In my UVA days, in my early 20s, I did have opportunity. I squatted 415 pounds, 
And the only reason that I was able to come up is because my strength and conditioning coach, and I will not say his name to save the innocent, he smacked me on the back of my head so hard <laughs> that when I stood up with the weight on the back of my head, I didn't realize that I had just squatted 415 pounds. That's a great motivator. I like that. Yeah. And, and again, when I turned around and looked at him, I realized how big and strong he was, uh -huh. and my anger went away really yeah. quickly. I didn't want that type of problem. I right, said, so thanks a lot, Coach. That's all right. <laughs> Well, that is Carlton Hurst, best defender on the team, and the, the idea was he was going to match up with Grayson Allen this afternoon and hope to try and neutralize the All-American guard for the Blue Devils, but uh, Allen and company have been as good as advertised. Well, and again, you know, when you have to go out and guard Grayson Allen, there are so many different components to that. You know, you have to try to take away the drive because he's great attacking the basket. But he's shooting the ball so well this season, when you play off him to take away the drive, he just pulls up and shoots the jumper. And more importantly, he's been very unselfish getting his teammates involved. You know, he's been one of the main, main guys getting the ball inside to these bigs. So give Grace now the credit for continuing to develop his game. And, and there, that's one, if you're South Dakota, you got to come away with those two points. Yeah, Hagedorn's been good, but he missed the dunk. It's funny, anytime you go into one of these arenas, Rupp Arena, Carrier Dome, Cameron Indoor, you see the players from the mid-major come in, and they just, they're going to have great memories one way or the other, win or lose, but that's a memory, boy, he wishes he's going to have that back. Especially being that we showed it three times. <laughs> <laughs> so if you missed it before, now all his family and friends opportunities to see it on replay, it's called him and text him about that now once the game is over. Well, Tyler Hagedorn is a junior from Norfolk, Nebraska. It's not Norfolk. Or how do you, you're from Virginia. It's, it's Norfolk in Virginia. But it's Norfolk in Nebraska. And he is a hoops junkie. His dad, longtime small college basketball referee. And so growing up, Tyler tagged along with Pops on any long drive he could to go watch basketball and get up shots during timeouts and do whatever he could just to be around the sport. Tristan Simpson with a nice stroke. He's got four. And Simpson again showing off that mid-range game and his ability to score off the dribble. And Tristan Simpson again. It's something about he and Marvin Bagley. He likes the challenge of the big guy having to guard him. It's the second time we've seen Simpson get in his trick bag to pull off a nice jumper off a of back. Who was the best big you might have been isolated with at one point and made look bad? Probably one of the best bigs of all time in the team of Ajuan. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. That's Dream, a good one. if you heard me, I said it on air. <laughs> he was so fun to play against because he would joke during the games because he honestly knew that, you know, there was nobody in the gym that could stop it. Uh -uh. You know, I, I went to San Antonio the year after um, he had his way with my former teammate David Robinson in 1995, whose son Justin is here on the Duke Rob, a Duke roster. But, um, you know, and, and, and playing against Dream was just so fun because he, and he would know everybody. It wasn't as though he didn't know, he knew everybody. And he had his ongoing jokes going during the game while he was out there giving us bucks. <laughs> Do you feel like the Coyotes have a little greater level of comfort here to start the second half? I, I believe they do. And, you know, when they came in yes, last night to practice and to shoot around, and we talked to Coach Smith about, you know, well, what does this game mean? You know, and, and he talked about, you know, hey, they went to TCU and played the Horn Frogs tough there in their environment, that this would not be a challenge. But coming to, to Cameron Indoor is a much bigger difference than playing at TCU solely because as a college basketball player, you grow up hearing about Cameron Indoor Stadium, the Cameron Crazies, how rowdy it gets in this building, and how good Duke is here. You know, I don't think that they took a picture at midcourt at TCU like they did last night at practice when they got to come in to Cameron Indoor and practice on this court. Well, so far this half, the Coyotes are winning the half 10 to 6. Yeah, and, and, that, and that's the key. Come in and if you can win a half, that gives Coach Smith so much to be able to tell his team when they get back home, hey, we beat the number one team in the country in a half, and the Coyotes are doing their best here in the second half to make that happen.
about two hours away from where we are in uh, Charlotte tonight. That place is going to be rocking. We have the Dr. Pepper ACC Championship game between number one Clemson, number seven Miami. A spot in the college football playoff is on the line for Davo Sweeney and the Tigers. 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 Pacific on ABC and live on the ESPN app. And I would like to, you know, send a shout out to all the North Carolina and Virginia State Troopers along 40, 85, 95 for me to get home in time to be able to see that game. Give me a pass. <laughs> All right. You've heard it. Hey, a police escort would be perfect. Why not? Here's Bagley, who has put up 19 points, 10 rebounds in 21 minutes. Give him an assist on the Bolden Slam. And give. Do credit for really being able to handle the post trap. That's one of the things that Coach K talked to us about earlier was he knew that they were going to post trap, and it gave them an opportunity to see how to play against different defenses. Craig Smith told us it was part of what they always do, and Duke handling it that, on that possession very well. Bolden trying to corral it. Ball still up for grabs, and the whistle comes. Held ball. And the possession arrow goes the other way. And you see Marquise Bolden getting on the floor for that basketball. Bolden had one of the biggest plays thus far in Duke's season. At Indiana, going down and getting a loose ball, getting on the floor after a loose ball, coming up with the possession. At a time where Duke was struggling to get back into that game, Indiana had built some momentum. And it changed the momentum in Duke's favor. They went on to win that game by 10 points. Enough so to where Grayson Allen actually tweeted the video of Marquise Bolden on the floor going after that basketball, showing his respect for his teammates' hustle play. Coach Chesevsky says that should be a held ball, and he winds up getting the call reversed. Hall of Famer speaks, and you listen. I mean, if I had to say anywhere that he has clout, <laughs> it would be here in this building. And as you see, just like that, the held ball and the possession arrow going back to the Blue Devils. So great recognition by Coach K there. You don't win over a thousand games in your career without winning an argument here and there. Nice great. left by Trayvon Duvall there, attacking the paint and recognizing the defender was great. Oh, now that's a nice pass. Laurier got himself in a tough spot and was hanging on for dear life. And it looks like both guys are OK. And it'll be Hagedorn who goes to the free throw line. And Duvall recognizing the shot blocker coming with the nice lefty John Killer, not a floater. I have to make sure I say that. I'm not a fan of the floater, so I'll make sure I talk about that. That was a John Killer instead. It's a difference. See, I taught you about the jelly roll. And I used that in Portland. Did you hear me I say that? I did hear you say it. I was proud of you. <laughs> Dan Dockage looked at me like, what are you talking about? Dockage don't know about the jelly. He don't know about the jelly. <laughs> but yet, so there's the jelly, and then there's the John Killer, which is an old term. Back in the day when you used to pretty much throw it to the roof and see if the big fella would just throw a shoulder out of socket trying to block your shot. Okay. <laughs> did you ever play with or against Ralph Sampson? I did not play with nor against him, but I did talk to him yesterday if that counts. Okay. <laughs> well, he to me back in what I think of as the golden age of college basketball was the epitome of that at seven foot four. If he was coming out, you had to throw it up to the Raptors to try and get it over. Yeah, and I, I do have to ask, Doug, I mean, how old do you think I am? I have gray hair. I get that. But how old do you think I am? Well, you as a 12-year-old were probably kicking the tail of high school kids, right? So you're way I, ahead. I, I like the compliment, and that is your way of trying to get out of trouble <laughs> of making me 10 to 15 years older. So because it was a compliment, I'm going to take it, just like Grayson Allen takes the easy three in the corner. Ralph played many years in the NBA. I thought you might have overlapped or in an alumni setting, something, no? Well, yeah, Ralph had about a 12, 13 year head start on me, but you know, we are from the same area, so you could say that there maybe would have been some opportunity, but it never happened. Yeah, I should probably quit before I'm too far behind. <laughs> South Dakota trying to trade baskets and make a move. They've gotten a good push from Tyler Peterson coming off the bench, the sophomore from Lino Lakes, Minnesota. So it was a 26 point game at halftime. Now 21, so you have to give South Dakota credit, South Dakota credit once again. They are outscoring Duke here in the second half. When you go into the locker room down 26, 
at this time, your coach is saying, hey, guys, listen, let's just go walk away with the positive. Whether we can come back and win this game or not, I don't know. But we can play well. And just like that, now 18-point game after the three-pointer by Brandon Armstrong. Ohio's head coach Craig Smith says that he asked each of his recruits, where would you like to play a game? They all say here. Got to be careful what you ask for sometimes. Man. Well, he says it's either Duke or Rupp Arena at Kentucky where they all want to play, and that's part of why this is such a big game for the Coyotes. Well, and it's been a big game for Tristan Simpson now attacking the paint, finding Brandon Armstrong for the corner three. And you see Coach Smith's reaction again. It's about let's do what we can do well against the best team in the country and build some confidence for us moving forward into our season. This is only one of 30 regular season games for the Coyotes. Of course, it's a big one because of the, the opponent and the venue. But they want to be able to walk away from here saying that they've got to be a better team because of this experience. Yeah, they have to play two or three or four of these guarantee games every year for budgetary reasons. And... Uh, they went to Gonzaga last year and really got smacked pretty good and felt like coming into this environment this year, they had a much better chance and feel for what it might be like to go against a Final Four worthy opponent. But when you go and play against, you know, a Duke team on, in this environment, it makes going and playing against the Jackrabbits of South Dakota State a lot different. You build some confidence there, and when you say, look, I know I can play against Duke, we can definitely play against the Jackrabbits. There's Coach Smith's parents, Dad Vernon, Mom Beverly, we had a chance to chat with last evening. They have made the long trip from tiny Stephen, Minnesota, part of a traveling party of more than 100. And Coach Craig Smith, his uh, wife Darcy, and their four children, including daughter Lauren, who is clearly the star of the show. Well, he made it clear that Lauren ran the show. Whether she's the star or not, she's the boss. <laughs> Out of that traveling party of over 100, there were a number of Coyotes fans and supporters who openly recognized the fact that, you know, they're Duke fans. But you got to put your blue hats and shirts away when you come to Cameron. Well, and, and one of Coach Smith's best friends and used to be an assistant coach for him at Mayville State when he started his coaching career, openly admitted there was a lot of Duke paraphernalia in his basement. But Coach Smith made sure to let him know he better not come in this gym today with a Duke shirt on. Well, I can attest, I saw them outside the uh, arena before we came in today, and they were wearing all red. <laughs> no blue. Agadorn back out front. The Coyotes have done much better here on this end in the second half. Allen comes up with a loose ball. Baseball pass ahead to the freshman, O'Connell. And it's Coyotes basketball. Tenth turnover for Duke. And if there's any one thing that Coach K can be disappointed about with his team so far, it is those ten turnovers. I believe they probably went the first ten minutes of the game without a turnover. And so when you look at it, the, the 18 minutes since has really been a bit lackluster for Duke handling the basketball. And many of those turnovers unforced, especially when you get out on a 3 on 2 break and you don't come away with points. Simpson has been hitting those shots. One and done, though, for the Coyotes. Bagley with another rebound. That's his 12th. And another turnover by Bagley. Duke up 22. Back in Durham, North Carolina, and it's hard to believe it's been almost 25 years since we lost Jim Valvano to cancer, but the friendship that he had with Duke head coach Mike Krzyzewski endures, as does Jimmy V's legacy through the V Foundation. Here's a tribute that Coach K gave to his friend. You and I became brothers during the last four or five months of your life. You knew that you were dying of cancer. The very best moment, though, was when you said, quote, I'm going to die, but I'm going to win, unquote. I asked you, what do you mean? Well, and by him saying, I want to be cancer after I die, when we finally be cancer, I want to be there. I was with you when you died, and I never looked at our relationship, you know, and moving forward. But when he talked about that with us before the game, he said that in, in Jimmy V's last five months of his life, he realized his purpose of being on this earth. Mm -hmm. And he was frustrated about the fact that there was no defense that he could design, no offense that he could design that would beat cancer. 
So therefore, this was his way of beating cancer. He did not feel like he lost his battle with cancer, even though he lost his life. And, and, and Coach K told us that he had a, you know, a terminal cancer that, that you could not be. There was no cure for it. But more importantly, he wanted to make sure that he found that play, whatever it was, that would beat him. Delorier will have a chance for three. Join ESPN and the V Foundation in the fight against cancer. Visit v.org slash donate. All donations benefit the V Foundation for cancer research. And Corey, you and I asked Coach K before the game this afternoon also what recollections he has from that iconic speech given at the ESPYs. And he said he remembered so vividly that actually Coach K and his wife Mickey flew with Jimmy V and his wife from North Carolina out to California for the ESPYs. And the whole time, Jimmy B was vomiting and leading right up until the point where he took the stage. They didn't know if he'd be able to stand there, let alone put together the words to make the speech that he did. And then we all saw basically as soon as the speech was over, Jimmy B collapsed into the arms of Coach K. And it really is remarkable what the human spirit can do to allow Jimmy B to, to do something and say something and get the V Foundation going. And he truly lives on 25 years later. And Coach K talked about really how it was just a, somewhat of a divine intervention because he flew with his, you know, his, his wife Pam, who held a bag for him actually to be able to get sick into on the plane, even at the ESPYs event. And then, of course, he gets on the stage and he said, you know, that was all Jimmy. It, it, it was not, he, he wasn't making stuff up, this, that, and that. That was just all Jimmy. And he, he said, you know, to his credit, Jimmy had some some extra with him now, no question about that. But when you saw him on that stage, that was all Jimmy right there. And then, of course, immediately once it was over, you know, he was down again. But for that time that he got his opportunity to speak out on his fight against cancer, it was just a, a divine intervention is also something was speaking through him because knowing, you know, that this fight was going to be bigger than his life and the legacy that he's left on has been tremendous. My favorite part of the speech was when he told the uh, director who was flashing a red light saying 30 seconds. <laughs> no, I got this. Pure Jimmy V. And you got to know him. He recruited you a little bit when you were in high school. He did. I, and I was fortunate to be recruited by him. I did save the actual, you know, back then you could send out the, the pamphlets. And I saved the pamphlet that had Fire and Ice, Rodney Monroe, Chris Cortiani, and I still have that till today. Nice. I have that one. You know, and again, you know, he was such an uh, influence in college basketball. When I was in, when I got to Virginia, he was actually calling games. So I got a chance to go over and talk to him before games every now and then. And just a pleasure to be around and just such a huge influence. I mean, and when you hear people that were involved in the game, they just tell stories about Jimmy B. It just makes you smile and you realize how much an influence he had over the game. And that nearly uh, a quarter century later, we're still talking about him and smiling. I mean, that would make him as happy as you could be. I mean, yeah, he was a guy that liked to be talking about. Yeah, he did. <laughs> he liked to talk and he was good at it. And, and I had, had the good fortune of meeting him once at ESPN up in Bristol. Just happened to be walking down the hall and he and Dickie V were walking to go to the studio to get on air and Jimmy V, true to what everybody who knew him said, he made sure to stop and get to know who Doug Sherman was in those five minutes. He wanted to know everything about me, where I was from and what common connections we might have. And come to find out, we did have two or three common friends. It really was me. Yeah. A special man. Grayson Allen with the basketball leading South Dakota midway through the second half. Allen and Bagley have been the offensive catalyst for Duke who in that first half scored more points and shot the basketball better than in any half they've done this season. Second half, it's been more Coyotes. And the putback by the young man they called Cheeks, Tyler Peterson. And you can see why. You were waiting to get Cheeks in. You wanted to get that one in. <laughs> Cheeks has nine points out of Centennial High School in Lionel Lakes, Minnesota. Beautiful spin move on the baseline. Fuller may have stepped out of bounds right there. Looked like that foot got on the line. And then, as you called it, Cheeks coming in with the offensive rebound put back. And you hear Craig Smith talk about this team, and, and he is really enjoying coaching his guys. Mm -hmm. You can see, you know, we talk about Jimmy V as a talker. 
Coach Smith is a talker too now. Oh, yeah. We spent an extra hour after practice just sitting down talking with him, learning about his team and his program yesterday. And he's a guy that likes to carry on a conversation and a very enjoyable person to be around, a great representative for South Dakota and what their program is about. And this is a program that is moving in the right direction with him at the helm. You know, and I can see this being one of those teams that, you know, has an opportunity to get into the NCAA tournament and go out and get a win and make some noise, you know, when you get to get to March Madness. South Dakota is expected to be among the contenders in the Summit League this year, along with South Dakota State, North Dakota State, Fort Wayne, Denver. Those are the top teams in the preseason poll. South Dakota has a record of 7-2 coming into this one. Shot clock under five. Out of bounds. Coyotes will keep it. Coming up next over on ESPN, it's number two Kansas and Syracuse in the third annual Hoop Hall Miami Invitational at American Airlines Arena. You can see this one streaming live on the app as well. And Corey, while you are driving home quickly to be able to see the football game tonight, I'm going to be driving home to the hotel quickly to catch that ball game. I know you are, Mr. Syracuse. You are excited to see the Orange who are doing, playing extremely well this year. I'm happy to see that. More importantly, my guy Franklin Howard mm. playing great basketball at the point guard position. Um, you know, and, and this was a season where coming into, I think people had a lot of question marks about Syracuse. But uh, Jim Beheim has got his team playing very well up there, but up to a tough task having to go up against Bill Self and the Jayhawks this afternoon. Yeah, the competition to date has not been nearly what they're about to see coming up tonight at 5.30 Eastern. And Gino Thorpe just left Syracuse, the grad transfer from USF, so that bench just got a lot shorter for the Orange. Peterson misfires. Goldwire runs the point, finds Grayson Allen. How good was the game for Grayson Allen in Chicago against Michigan State? A Spartans team that completely shut down Carolina last week. He lit them up for, what did he have, 37? 37. He made seven three-pointers in that game, but the most important part about that was that he did it without Marvin Bagley on the floor for the majority of that game. Marvin Bagley, four points and six rebounds in 10 minutes in that game, but got poked in the eye and missed the remainder. And from there, Grayson Allen just took over that game. And he was playing in a, you know, again, Duke at that time had pretty much one big on the floor. Mm -hmm. So he was able to attack the basket. But he gave a lot of credit to his two young backcourt mates, Trayvon Duvall, who had 17 points and 10 assists in that game. When they asked Grayson Allen, what's the difference? He said Trayvon Duvall got him the basketball where he could be successful. And we can't remember, and Coach K would not let us remember, the guy that hit the biggest shot in that game, although he did not have a great game, Gary Trent Jr., mm -hmm. came up with a huge bucket for Duke right when they needed it to be able to top Michigan State, who, in my opinion right now, is the second-best team in the country. Yeah, they are really good, and they have not been fully whole because Miles Bridges has not been fully whole. And just think about the talent that Coach Izzo has assembled. You, you can't imagine a scenario where they don't, they don't get to the Final Four. And a lot of it has to do with the fact of the way that they're playing defensively. You know, it's a team, of course, that can score points. When you talk about Bridges and Jaron Jackson Jr., Nick Ward, Cassius Winston, comes on there. They've got a bunch. Just like the five guys from the Blue Devils all touched the ball on that possession to end up with the beautiful dunk. But that's the way Michigan State plays offensively, but defensively, they are playing at a different level than I believe anyone else is in college basketball. Trent got his hand on the basketball. It goes out of bounds. USD will keep when we come back. If you want to draw it up the way it's supposed to be done, go wire to DeLaurier. DeLaurier to Duvall. Duvall. And Wendell finishes it off. The Duke Blue Devils put on a clinic in transition. All five players touched the basketball, leading to a dunk by Wendell Carter Jr. And the freshman from Atlanta is very clearly one of the best bigs in the country, but does he make your top five? Well, he can't make my top five yet because when you think about the fact that his teammate Marvin Bagley is number one, Bonzi Colson, who could be a National Player of the Year candidate as well, DeAndre Ayton, although Arizona has struggled, Ayton has not. Robert Williams at Texas A&M has been huge. And then, of course, 
Azubuki at Kansas and what Kansas has been able to do this year has been amazing behind him as the post presence. If we extend that list to top 10 as the shot clock comes down, Hagedon with a sweet reverse. Would uh, you wind up putting Carter on a top 10 list? Is he I, I, that far along? Oh, he definitely would be on the top 10 list along with Ethan Happ out of Wisconsin, who I believe is really good. Doesn't have as much help this year. Mm. But you know, th there are so many guys that you can add to that list. And it was hard trying to find five. It wasn't hard trying to figure out number one, though. That was probably the easiest part of yeah. my task. No doubt. <laughs> and you know, you put Bonzi Colson on there, and you have to, but he's 6'5". Yeah. So calling him a big almost doesn't seem right, but he plays big, and he's definitely one of the best players in the country. Duvall missed the layup. Hagedone's had a very nice game. 14 points for Tyler Hagedorn plus that rebound. He averages 13 points, five boards a game for USD. He has the ability to shoot the three ball, an opportunity at the top of the key, unable to take advantage of it. But that's what makes Hagedorn different is as a, a five man, he really can shoot the basketball. We talk about Wendell Carter Jr. He can do the same. Wendell Carter has three point range. And one of the things that we're seeing from him as well as many of these Duke players, they have to sacrifice, they're having to sacrifice a lot of their game to make this thing work. You know, the one guy who's really not having to sacrifice a lot, although he is little, is Bagley. But when you're that level of talent, coaches play through you. And Bagley is getting his opportunities. Wendell Carter not getting as many opportunities. But still, a young man that has five double-doubles on the season is taking advantage of the time that he's getting. Peterson, no. Mooney, extra pass. He picks up the assist on the layup by Fuller. Former Cornhuskers got eight. Let's go, D! Fuller had a career-high 15 points last time out against... UMKC and you're talking about a young man that only played in 55 games in his Nebraska career But he actually was there when coach Greg Smith was a assistant coach and that kind of was his workout guy They spent a lot of time together when he was a red shirt So that kind of made for an immediate relationship when he was there when he arrived at South Dakota He comes up with the steal, but then turns it right back over to Duke Well for coach Smith they still have another uh, star the uh, the name the big blue blood name on the schedule to come they will travel to Pauley Pavilion later this month on December 19th to take on UCLA and coach Smith shared his stories of having met coach Wooden back in the day well you can't just say met coach Wood you, you got, I mean if you're going to say that you got to tell some of the story <laughs> I was setting you up for it <laughs> did you get an opportunity to look at the upcoming schedule for South Dakota, you see that December 19th matchup at UCLA. But Coach Smith, of course, Don Meyer, a mentor of his, a great coach in himself, who actually broke Bobby Knight's records, record for most wins before his passing. And, you know, it, it got Coach Smith in the car and said, hey, I want you to ride with me. Mm -hmm. And along the way, they just stop off in the neighborhood and go to the door. And who answers the door other than John Wooden? Yeah. You know, and he gets the opportunity to sit and spend four hours with John Wooden at his home and go to go to lunch. And he said, you know, even though he couldn't afford it, right. he actually did spring for lunch, buying Coach Wooden lunch that day. He said he his family probably couldn't eat for a week afterwards. But <laughs> no. Well, at that point, he had a, a wife and, and three of their four children were born and, and didn't have enough money. But on short notice, he's asked to go out. To Westwood, and he's got to buy a $500 plane ticket. I can't afford a $500 plane ticket, but he afforded it and wound up having a, a memory of a lifetime and bought Coach Wooden dinner. So, and and he can tell that story today, which is something that very few people have the opportunity to say. Not only that they met John Wooden, but he got to go and sit down in his home and spend four hours with him. And whatever money he spent on that plane ticket and that and that lunch was all worth it to be able to have that experience. No doubt about it. The 2017 Summit League Coach of the Year. And you see the goaltending here as Cheeks gets his hand underneath the rim, taking away a highlight dump from Javin Delorier, but Javin still gets the two points. One way to block a shot. Nick Fuller continues to be a nice offensive option coming off the Coyotes bench. He's into double figures now with 10. And with his experience playing at Nebraska, I believe he's a young man that will give South Dakota 
an opportunity to really be able to compete in the Summit League and more importantly gives Coach Smith that guy coming off the bench as he's already in double figures now for the second consecutive game. He gives him a guy that he can rely on that's not going to get rattled in big environments because he's played in them before and more importantly has the ability to put points on the board quickly coming off of that bench. Fuller 6'7 senior from Sun Prairie Wisconsin already obtained a business degree from the University of Nebraska currently pursuing his master's in interdisciplinary studies at the University of South Dakota. Five minutes to go in regulation. Alex O'Connell back into the game and uh, travel called against Jordan Goldwire the freshman from North Cross Georgia. Seventeenth turnover for Duke after having gone more than ten minutes in the first half without one. Well, and, and, and those ten minutes to start the game honestly was where the game was won for the Blue Devils. But then when you think about that's a season high 17 turnovers for them. And we talked about how the rotation was going to be a little deeper today than it normally is. And you see Gowar getting, you know, pretty good minutes here today. Alex O'Connell getting opportunity to play heavy minutes as well as Marquise, Marquise Bolden and Delorier. And these guys get opportunities in a normal environment. As we see the 18th turnover now for the Blue Devils. But they don't get as many. And that's something where I'm sure Coach K is going to talk with his team about this and try to get that cleaned up because that's something that when you have an explosive offense like the Blue Devils have, averaging close to 91 points per game, the one thing that you can't afford to do is give the basketball away. to the bucket for two. He's got 14. Hard foul given by Javin Delorier. We'll step away from Cameron. Duke looking to go 10-0. Sports Center on ESPN with Scott Van Pelt follows all the games on Championship Saturday. Reese Davis, Chris Fowler, Kirk Herbstreet, and Booger McFarland join the show to talk college football playoff top four. Plus, head coaches from around the country lobby their cases. And is Tiger Woods remaining in contention at the Hero World Challenge? Well, he was plus three today. Where does that put him on the leaderboard if he's even still on the leaderboard? Sports Center at midnight Eastern with SVP, also available on the ESPN app. With Corey Alexander, I'm Doug Sherman at Cameron Indoor Stadium, and Duke on the verge of a perfect 10 to start the season. Tyler Hagedorn now with 16 points to lead the visiting Coyotes. You know, this is, uh, of course, the holiday season, and so uh, in downtown Durham this morning at about 11 o'clock, they had their annual holiday parade. And from my room, I don't know if you heard the same thing from your room, the first thing I heard this morning, Sports Center anthem. Theme music from Sports Center. that's what I looked out yes. my window. Did it in, <laughs> did it in. <laughs> Absolutely, I knew exactly what you were talking about. <laughs> and and even, even more so than that, I had a chance to cross the parade. Nice. Yeah. I couldn't get my car out of ballet, so I had to walk. And I was escorted by the ballet. When the parade stopped, I actually walked across the street <laughs> during the parade with my bag, with my jacket in hand, to get to my car to come over to the game. We will finish that story to see how he managed not to get hit by anybody in the parade when we come back. Marvin Bagley the third has been well. Marvin Bagley the third today for Duke. He just keeps getting it done for the Blue Devils. And you would say he's just doing what he does. Marvin Bagley all over the glass, continues to finish around the rim, throws in a three-pointer here and there. The reason why he's my top freshman in the country, but does have company. Again, I believe he's the best player in the country, but when you look at Trey Young, Colin Sexton, DeAndre Ayton, and Kevin Knox and what they've been able to do, this makes up my top five freshmen in the country. You know, Trey Young's 43-point performance 
special. Mm. But you know, one thing I have to tell you about that, his dad, Rayford Young, actually went for 41 versus Kansas when he was at Texas Tech. So again, he can go home and say, Dad, I got you on that one, but not by much. <laughs> So That's those were in order for you, right, top that, to bottom. So that Colin is top Sexton, who may be the most exciting freshman of the bunch, was able to score 40 points, and the majority of them going against Minnesota three on five. That's pretty good. That, that, is, that is very impressive, no question about it. And I had the opportunity to, you know, see a lot of those guys in the McDonald's All-American game this past spring and seeing it. And Jay Williams, the Duke legend, and I got a chance to judge a three-point contest. And for the record, I picked Trey Young coming out was going to be the winner and he won so nice. Trey made me look good on that one. But you know when you we had the opportunity to see these young men at a high school level and then see how much they evolved moving into their freshman year. I marveled at the type of shape that Trayvon Duvall and Wendell Carter Jr. have gotten themselves into the way that their bodies look today compared to where they were you know a few months ago back in April playing the McDonald's game. It's been a tremendous difference. One of the things that we talked with, you know, Coach K about their strength and conditioning program and what they're doing here, Duke, because both of those guys are much leaner and better athletes today than they were six months ago. Some of the bench players for the Coyotes getting an opportunity as well to say they played at Cameron Indoor Stadium. That's the starting point guard, Tristan Simpson, who's got 10 points. I like seeing Justin Robinson in the game for Duke, of course, son of David and Valerie. Robinson, David the Hall of Famer, the Admiral with the Spurs, and Justin wearing the number 50. Like that. And according to Nate James, the athleticism is there and his ability to block shots like that. He feels like he's a young man that really can be a part of this program as they move forward into the future. How about the statement made to Jeff Goodman, the ESPN College Basketball Insider, earlier this week by David Robinson, comparing Marvin Bagley III to Tim Duncan? Now, I love David Robinson. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I will say this. I was a teammate of Tim Duncan's as well. We were in San Antonio together. And um, the three of us, David, myself, and Tim, Tim was so different as a basketball player than Bagley. And David says, you know, of course, he reminds him a little bit of him. But the way that Tim played, Tim was never as athletic as Marvin Bagley. But Tim's ability to operate on the post was second to none. And, you know, when you look at Marvin Bagley as an 18-year-old, and you can see how he has to improve. He's very left-hand dominant. So even when he goes right, oftentimes he comes back to his left hand. Tim was very good with both hands. But, you know, you're also talking about a Tim Duncan who was a, you know, senior at Wake Forest, you know, and then his rookie year when David saw him. I played against Tim when he was a, a sophomore, freshman and sophomore at Wake Forest. He was nowhere near this talented when he arrived at Wake Forest compared to when he left. Marvin Bagley's talent level right now, you know, projects to him being a – future Hall of Famer just like Tim Duncan from that respect. So that's where I'll say they're similar. Okay. But I don't think their games are very similar. O'Connell is fouled by Peterson and will head to the line. So Tim Duncan is known, of course, as the big fundamental. Does Marvin Bagley have that sort of basis to be thought of as that good fundamentally? You know, we talk about how great he is athletically in a lot of skills, but in terms of the pure fundamentals, where does he stand in his growth? Well, I, I, he's, he's very fundamentally sound, and he has a long way to go, in my opinion. But the game has changed so much from what a guy that's six foot 11, like Marvin Bagley is right now, mm -hmm. and Tim Duncan, who really was seven feet, might have been listed as 6'11". <laughs> but the game has changed so much in the 20 years since Tim Duncan came out of college compared to now where Marvin Bagley is playing, that big men, at, you know, if you call them bigs, are expected to do so many things differently. I don't think Tim took many three-pointers when he was at, at Wake Forest. I don't think Tim rarely, I mean, brought the ball up the floor that often. He didn't lead the break doing the things that Bagley is doing right now 20 years later, but that's just the evolution of the game. 19 points, 12 rebounds for Bagley on 8 of 11 shooting. His season averages will actually suffer a little bit in this game, only because he's not playing nearly the minutes. But you see a fifth straight double-double. He's among the national leaders in that category. And I'll say this. We 
talk about what Bagley does that Duncan didn't do. Marvin Bagley's good on the block. Tim Duncan was great. Yeah. And he was when he was in college as well. Yeah. And here's a look at the young man who is the presumptive number one overall pick in the 2018 NBA draft. Out of Phoenix, Arizona, reclassified over the summer to the class of 27 and turned what was a really, really good incoming recruiting class here at Duke into a BAFO recruiting class. So much talent. Jack White getting an opportunity. A sophomore from Australia will head to the free throw line. All right, I got to rewind the tape. It was a what? I said BAFO, and as I was getting to BAFO, I'm like, I'm not going to want to say that, but I said it. All right, now you got to tell me what that means. Great. It's a it's beyond great beyond great beyond great Baffo. Baffo. Yeah, it's not good B O double F O so I can change my name from Alexander the great to Alexander the Baffo no, stick with what you got <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Seriously, I got about three words from it and I'm like I'm gonna hear about this <laughs> And it would have been probably better for me to let it go, but you know, I'm not gonna do that with you at this point no. Absolutely <laughs> And we didn't get back to your parade story. So did any trombones hit you while you were dodging through the band in the, the parade this morning? I will tell you the best part of it, as I was going across, I heard someone say, oh, he's playing Frogger. In the middle, in the middle of the parade, I hear someone say, he's playing Frogger. You cannot make this stuff up. And I just started laughing going across. I mean, again, I actually have my bags, you know, walking across the street. You can't make this stuff up. I wished I had looked out my window at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I've got to be part of the parade in Durham, North Carolina. Jack White. And an over-the-back foul is going to be called on Justin Robinson. Well, what do you think now of Duke two hours after we got this started where they've gone from 9-0 about to be 10-0 in terms of being the number one team in the country? I think they are getting better, which is scary. I mean, to think about how good they've been, you know, the wins that they've had getting to this point, but the fact that they are getting better and how scary they could be when we get to March. I mean, and, and I'm excited, you know, that this team is in the ACC and I have an opportunity to watch them and cover them all year long. And more importantly, as a college basketball fan, to be able to watch a group of talented young men get together and play the game the right way that the like the Blue Devils are doing. Shot clock is off. The Blue Devils don't need to shoot again. And it appears that Alex O'Connell and company will be Happy to dribble out an impressive victory. They controlled the game right from the outset and beat the Coyotes 96 to 80. Led by their super freshman Marvin Bagley's double double, Duke improves to 10 0. That's it for us here. Up next, it's Villanova versus St. Joseph's in a Big Five showdown. For Corey Alexander, I'm Doug Sherman. So long from Durham, North Carolina.